In this video, we are going to cover Windows Server Overview Lecture with Lab. I hope that you have covered Workgroup versus Domain, Active Directory, DNS, DHCP. Then this video will make a lot more sense to you. So basically, another fun fact is that this video is done by Brad William. He started uh, JSS training a few years ago, and today he's a senior systems administrator, which is an amazing feeling for us when someone like that come back to the community and and give back to the community and he's still in the discord if you would like to know his story go to job skill share go to youtube type job skill share click on playlist and on the bottom right here you can check his full playlist uh two years ago when he shared his first story as an 18 year old he became an it support professional with no background in it and then he became a systems administrator and today he's a senior system administrator moving all around the world proud of him very proud of him so make sure you go and check his story out as well then you're going to love his teaching when you come over here and you watch his video it's more than one hour long video and i hope you will learn a lot about the server so once you open this let's go ahead and open you're going to see a video like this he's going to cover a lot of fundamentals and he is using the sandbox so you can click on the sandbox so wherever he's clicking let's say P Lab, SA Server, Standalone, or let's say MD01, you can do the same things to replicate some of the skills that he's teaching uh, with a hands on approach. Hello, everyone. So, today in this video, we're going to go over kind of like a broad slash and then get into more detail of what a Windows Server is. Um, Windows Servers are very popular environments. You're, there's almost no way you're not going to see them in an environment. And so it's very important to know what they are, um, kind of the basics of what they can do. And also, how can we secure them? Because, yeah, we might know what they can do, but we also want to secure them too. So uh, what are we going to cover? Um, so we're going to cover, there's usually two main um, Windows servers versions that um, companies are on. Most of them are 2016 and 2019, so we're going to go through those two, some of them are on 2022. And then we're also going to go through the end of support dates. We're going to cover what a server UI looks like. We're going to cover how servers can be managed using PowerShell. So for example, you can manage a server with Active Directory installed on it through PowerShell. And you can use PowerShell to monitor the performance of the server, manage services of the server, etc. We're going to cover the server security of it. So going back to what I said earlier, how to secure the server, um, some best practices with them, patch updates, um, Windows Firewall config for the company you're at or whatever company you're going to, um, BitLocker is a common one, um, Windows Defender, which is a built-in, and then you have something called RBAC, which is role-based access control. And then we're also going to cover the server manager, so install and remove server roles, which is a role is, con is considered as like a DNS server, that's you install the role of the DNS, um, monitoring the server performance, um, event logs that you can do. Um, in the server manager, you have like are all the roles that you install on it, are they healthy or not? So we can go over that. And then we also have some server specific tools, so such as Windows Server Backup, um, File Resource Manager, um, RDP Services Manager, things like that. And then we also have local features on a server. So you have your print and document services, your Hyper-V, file and storage services, etc. And we're also going to cover common features on a server. So what are some of the common features? You have Active Directory domain services. You have DNS, DHCP, web server, file server. So on the back end, I'm going to set some of those up and then show you all, like once it's set up, uh, what does it look like from there? Because in most companies, you're not going to be going to a, most of the time, you're not going to go to a company and they're going to say, hey, we have to set all this up from scratch. Most of the time it will be set up, but just say if you want to, just say you have a Windows 2012 server that has DNS on it and you want to migrate that over to Windows Server 2019 because 2012 might not be reliable anymore and you're having issues with that server, instead of troubleshooting the actual server, the OS of it, operating system, you might just want to migrate it to Windows Server 2019. So then you are going to kind of have to set it up from scratch, but that's something that 
um, your company will have to decide. Um, and, and I'm sure if you're migrating from server 2012 to 2019, you're going to know um, they're going to have some sort of process documentation, so you can kind of follow that too, hopefully. But that is kind of why you need to know how to set it up from scratch. And in my opinion, if you know how to set something up from scratch, then the troubleshooting process, when trouble, when issues do occur, it's going to be much easier and going to feel a lot more confident. So without further ado, um, we're first going to go over what the versions um, that most companies are on, a kind of end of support dates, and something called a patch life cycle or or a fix life cycle and we'll just go one by one through these little rectangle boxes and show you all kind of like a broad overview of of what a windows server is all right guys so the first thing that we're going to cover is um, what version most companies are on for their windows servers and then kind of like the extend, uh, kind of like the supported dates for these um, s versions that the Windows server is running on. Um, because I mean, we might know how to install something, but we don't want to be installing outdated stuff or stuff that might be coming to an end date soon for support, um, for security updates, things like that. So we kind of want to know what we're actually installing and what kind of version we're installing. So as you can see here, we have Windows Server 2016, and believe it or not, a lot of companies are probably still on Windows Server 2016 um, because as you can see, the support dates, the extended end date for support basically is January 12th of 2027, which we have plenty of time to get things migrated over to Server 2019 or 2022. But the mainstream end date is basically already done, but there is an extended end date on this and if we go down here, we can see what additions that are basically supported through the extended end date. And if we scroll back up here, we can see the Windows Server 2016 follows a fixed lifecycle policy. And before we go over that, um, we're just going to go to the Windows Server 2019 now. And a lot of companies are also on Windows Server 2019. I There is Windows Server 2022, but I really don't know how much companies are really using that yet. Uh, the Windows Server 2019, the extended end date is not till 2029. So we have way more than time. I mean, we don't even really have to think about getting this upgraded probably just yet in, in companies. And you can see this is also under the fixed lifecycle policy. And if we scroll down a little bit more, you can see the data center essentials and standard are the additions for this. And if we go to the fixed lifecycle policy, this is basically saying, hey, um, we're going to extend the um, end date for the support, and you have a minimum of five years for the mainstream support, which if you click here, then it will basically go through what the mainstream support is. And this is all documentation that's online available to you all at no additional cost or anything like that. So if we scroll up a little bit, you can see the lifecycle phases for products. And this is kind of like, what is available, what is not. So your security updates, um, your those are going to be available, which is good. Your non-security updates is not going to be available for your extended support. And then your extended support um, basically comes from your almost your extended end date almost. And then you have your paid support. You know, it's paid, it's going to be available. Your self-help is going to be available and things like that. Um, so this is just all documentation that you can read up on. So you can see your extended support. You get security updates and no additional costs. Great. Awesome. You have your service packs here. Um, so this is just all documentation. These are, you just want to pause the video, take, take the screenshots or something of these links right here. So we have this one. We have the Windows Server 2019. And then we have the Windows Server 2016. So that's kind of like what what the end dates are on these. Um, the two most common Windows Server years that or versions that people are still on, and the fixed um, lifecycle policy for these Windows servers. So without further ado, um, next we're going to go over what the server UI looks like and kind of get a basic understanding of what you're going to be seeing once you RDP into a server, stand one up, something along those lines. UI that you're mostly going to see when you go into a server. 
click on the Windows icon, and we go to Server Manager. Um, so try managing from Windows Admin Center. That's another feature within inside of here. We don't want to show this message again. So as you can see, this is a little bit different than what you would see on a Windows 10 machine. Um, on the left here, you have all kind of self-explanatory things. You have your dashboard, which is what we're looking at here. You have your local server, which is locally to your machine. So if we click on local server, um, you can kind of see we have events down here, which is almost kind of like the event viewer almost. You have your work, computer name, work group, and just a bunch of other stuff about your machine that you're on. And then we also have all servers, which is your all servers that are here. And we only have this one because it's standalone. And there's also a file and storage services on here. So you can see we have our server name here. These are your volumes. So if you want to create different volumes for different disk, um, and then you have your disk. So we only have one disk, it looks like. And then you have your storage pools. So if we go back up to here, to the dashboard, you can see we have our, well, up here we can configure this local server. So this stuff, you can, you can add roles and features in which you can also do that from manage up here. And then add roles and features. So you can basically do the same stuff here as you can over here. And then you're probably wondering, well, what is a role? So basically a role is, if we go to tools right here, is it going to click? Okay. So as you can see, like a Hyper-V manager is basically a role. Um, and as you can see down here, we have our Hyper-V right here. So this would be the role. Now, as you can see, there's all green, which is good. It's healthy. Nothing going on with it. This is where you can monitor your status of things. So your all servers would be everything, basically. And as you can see, it, it all looks good to me. All green. So if we scroll back up here. So if we go to uh, this little flag right here. So this would... It, this will tell you like, hey, something's not configured properly, or when you go and stand up a Active Directory domain service on, on a Windows server, you'll get, hey, you got to complete additional configuration. That's where this will come from up here. And if we go to Manage, we can add roles and features, and we can also remove roles. So we could remove the Hyper-V role, but we don't want to do that. Um, so if we do add roles and features, This is where you can add your roles and features. Installation type role based because we want to add a role. We're not doing the remote desktop service installation, which is a whole other subject. And we're doing it on this server. So these are like kind of your different roles that can be installed. These are all roles that can be installed on a Windows server. Um, so for example, you have your Active Directory domain services. This is where you would get your Active Directory users and computers from. Um, and then you have your DHCP, which is what leases the IP addresses out. You have your DNS server, fax server, um, web server is a common one too. So these are all the kind of different roles that you can install on a server. We just cancel out of this. I mean, that's really about it with this. Um, if we go to Hyper-V Manager... If it will click. So this is our Hyper-V manager. We have our events here. Um, we can scroll down. And then we have our services and stuff. And then best practices anal um, analyzer. There's a bunch of different things you can do with inside of a server UI. Um, it's more than just like a Windows 10, um, because obviously with a Windows server, you have more features and more things you're going to need to be able to do. 
So that about does it for like the Windows Server UI of things. Next, we're going to go over how you can manage a Windows Server from PowerShell. PowerShell is very common in the sysadmin world. So we'll go over that next, and then we'll keep on going through the um, keep on going through the checklist that we have for an overview of a Windows Server. Okay, now we're going to go over how you can manage a Windows Server with PowerShell. And this is not an in-depth video or anything like that. This is just a basic overview of some things you can do with PowerShell to manage your Windows Server. So one of the things is if your server is um, running Active Directory, you can basically manage Active Directory with PowerShell possibly. So one example is by creating a user account. In the first, com in the first little command slash script we have is creating a new AD user. So we're doing new dash ad user, putting the dash name, my name, the given name, the surname, SAM account name, the display name, the user principal name. So what is the username that they're going to be logging into these um, PC with? And then the account password, the enablement of the account, which is true, and then the path. So we have, I created a new OU called test. The domain controller, so every name of the domain controller is separated by a comma. So if you have just say practice labs dot com dot test, whatever it is, um, you can do DC equals practice labs and then comma DC equals com. So once we press enter on this, we will see it will not return any errors or anything like that. So there you go. So there's no errors or anything like that. But if we switch to our Active Directory instance, Windows Administrative Tools, Active Directory, Users and Computers, we can see if we ex we can see when we go to test, we have our example account right here. That's one of the things you can do with this. Um, another, and this is this is not a not, this is not a whole command you can do. There's more stuff you can add to this, but this is just one example. Another thing you can do is if we just press the up arrow a couple times. Actually, let's go ahead and we're going to clear this out. And we're just going to go down one. So another command we can do is we just press up a few times. Da 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 da. -da. we can actually get the processing, the processor time. So if we just press enter on this, so right now we have a zero processor time, but if we just clear this, we, so now it's 0 0.525, da 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 da. Um, so that's how you can get like the processor time. You can also retrieve the services on the computer too. So if we clear this out, and we go to, so this is the git dash process. And so this is going to list the first five processes that we have running on the machine. So you can see we have PowerShell, the DNS, um, MS, MP, ENG, the Active Directory Web Services, and the Explorer. Uh, but if we go up again, Because we might want to see what the CPU usage on the first five processes are. So we can just add a comma and then CPU. And then that will give us the CPU utilization on whatever those five first five processes are. Another thing we can do with PowerShell is we can actually restart services. So the NTDS is one of the services. It's the Active Directory Domain Services. And one of the things you can do with this is if you're having issues with maybe your domain service system, you need to restart something, you can do it from here. But you're going to see the Active Directory Domain Services actually has um, dependencies. So if we press Enter on this, it's going to give us an error because, as you can see, because it has dependent services. So as and it even says in here, it can only be stopped if the force flag is set. You're probably wondering, well, what the heck is that? Uh, so let's clear this out again.
and we're going to go up a few times and then you can see here now we have the NTDS dash force. And what that's going to do is that's going to basically force the restart. It's going to give us a couple messages saying, hey, waiting for the um, DNS service to start, DNS server. And then once that goes through a couple of times, it will automatically restart for you and come back up. Yep, so there we go. So the um, NTDS service is now restarted. So this is just like a general overview of PowerShell and how you can manage it with Windows servers. There's way more stuff you can do. With this stuff, you can manage your DNS and things like that. Um, this is just a broad overview of one, you can manage it with your Active Directory. Two, you can manage it with your um, CPU utilization with your services, list your services. And then three, you can restart services with it. All right, guys, now we're gonna go over some Windows security stuff that is built into Windows servers. Um, so the first one is very uh, very basic, I would say. Um, it's basically the Windows um, patches. So we just click on the Start menu and we type in Updates. So we can go and check for updates here. So if we check here, it's gonna tell us, hey, you have a bunch of updates you need to do. And sometimes with the companies, people use like SCCM and things like that to man um, automatically push out updates um, based on a regular schedule, like maybe once or twice a month, maybe. So if we just check for these updates, and we can also like change for the active hours, we can view the update history, advanced options, there's even, like if you see an update that came in and it suddenly just crashed everything or something doesn't work out of nowhere, you can remove that update and then check into the update um, specifics and see what the update actually entailed to see what maybe might have crashed your service or whatever that was um, running that did not work anymore. Come on, computer. So while that's loading, we're just gonna go to the Windows firewall that is built into here. So we do firewall. First, we're just gonna do Windows Defender firewall. As you see, everything is on right now. We can turn it off. We can restore defaults, change notification settings. Um, this is a good one, allow an app or feature through the Windows Defender firewall. So this is kind of if you want to lock stuff down even more. This is a bunch of stuff you can allow or not allow private. There's basically domain, public, everywhere. And then we can also do um, advanced Windows Defender Firewall with advanced security. And this is where you can start configuring a lot more stuff. So inbound rules, something coming into the server. We just do right click new rule. And then you can allow a program, a port, uh, predefined or custom. So if we just say you don't want ICMP requests um, coming into the server. So we just do port. And then you can just do TCP UDP probably TCP or UDP. Um, and then you can just do the port of the ICMP. Um, you can then just, or for simplicity, just say we do port 22 for SSH. Do next. You can allow the connection, allow connection if it's secure, or you can just block the connection all around. You can also allow programs. So if we do new rule, then we can do a program. So just say you don't want a certain program running on this computer. You can basically say, hey, put in the program pass. And when they try to open it, it's not going to open, basically. Um, sometimes I have seen when you allow a program, um, even, though you, even though you don't allow the program, you can actually open it up as an administrator, but a regular standard user won't be able to open it.
and then outbound rules same thing anything that is going out of the server so same setup as the inbound rules it's just you're going to the outbound now then you have your connection security rules new rule here so what type of connection security rule do you want to create so server to server authentication isolation uh, so you can restrict connections based on authentication criteria such as domain membership or health status. So if we just click next on this, then you can do whatever one is the one you want from here. So we'll authenticate whenever possible. Authentication is not required. We'll click next. And we'll just do default, next. And then basically you can put where does the rule apply the domain, private, you just connect to private network locations such as home or workplace and then you have your public which is your public network connection so we just click cancel out of this that's that and then you have monitoring here so this is your you're monitoring everything here you active firewall rules this kind of goes back to the monitoring part you can see everything that comes in And you have your security association, your main mode. So just say we right click this, view, add, remove, things like that. There's nothing here because we haven't set up anything yet. All right, so that's kind of like the Windows firewall. Um, pretty self explanatory inbound, coming inbound to the server, outbound, you're going outbound, things like that. And a lot of times when you set up a new Windows server, and you just like a Windows Server ISO basically the ICMP coming in or going out might not always be um, enabled right away so if you're you're like well I put this on the network this and that but I can't ping it probably because of your ICMP request uh, that's turned off and usually that can be found so just say so if we do inbound rules so like your file and printer sharing I see I see MPV4. So your private is checked off, your domain is not. So let's see if the Windows. So we cannot connect to the update service. Try again later. So that's probably because this server cannot get out to the internet. So we'll open the network features. We'll go to change adapter options. We'll go to Ethernet properties. Is this not even turned on? Okay, so it's under this one. So what we want to do is we want to basically change this to 8.8.4.4. .8 Hit OK. Close. Now when we go back to the update services, Now it should start checking for updates again. And next one is the Windows Defender. So Windows Defender settings. And this is kind of saying, hey, everything's good to go from what Windows sees. And you have your, so if we just do open Windows Security, you can see here we have a little bit more options here. Everything is green, which is good. Go down to this one, you have no current threats, you can do a quick scan. Everything is good here. And if we go to the firewall, all the firewalls on. And actually you can allow an app to the firewall here. Um, network and internet troubleshooter, which doesn't always work. So the cool thing about the Windows servers and just Windows devices in general, there's a lot of ways to do the same thing. So just because we went to the Windows Server, the Windows Firewall through here, through the Start menu, you can also get through it to the Windows Security through here. And you can check apps and files, and then you can also do Device Security Core Isolation, things like that. So that's that. Windows Update. So yep. Yeah, so now you can see all these Windows updates are here. So this is kind of saying, hey. You want to do these updates, this and that. And it is pending install right now. Uh, so you can see this one is installing. So but that's kind of like the Windows update process of things. So that's the, kind of the basic stuff for the Windows security. 
And that is just a general overview of the Windows security and there's more in-depth things you can do, uh, but that's just a general overview of how Windows Server security um, works and kind of features it has. Okay, now we're gonna go over what the basics of like the Windows Server Manager is. So we're not gonna go over like this dashboard right here, but we're gonna go over kind of what the basics of the actual Windows Server Manager is. So this is a server manager. This is the dashboard of the server manager. So in here, as we talked earlier, we go to manage, we can add roles and features, and then we can remove roles and features. So when you go to add roles, and just say we need to add DNS on this box. Um, we can just go to DNS server right here. And it's going to bring up what it's going to install. So it's going to install the DNS server tools. Um, and I was I would always check include management tools unless you know for sure you don't need them, or if they're even um, or if they're even being used or not. And then these are the features. So I mean, you probably don't need any of this. Uh, for adding just a standard DNS role, but these are some features that you can put through here. And then this is the DNS server, so this is kind of like a background of what it is, and then just some things to note. And then you can click install right here. Um, I would always check restart destination server automatically, only if you know that this server can 100% be restarted in the environment or in production if you are installing a new role on it. Usually if you're installing a new role, new role most likely the server will be able to be restarted because um, you're probably not going to be playing around with the server during production hours with that it is actually being actively used if you're installing a new role or something. So that's kind of like the how to add roles and stuff. And then we can go to remove roles and this is kind of like the same process. So this is the server you're picking. And then these are the roles you can uninstall. So this we can we could uninstall this if we wanted to. Uh, so this cannot be removed. Um, but like Hyper-V, you can probably, yeah, so this you can probably uninstall, but you click just click next, 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 and then uninstall it. So this is where you can kind of manage your whatever whatever roles are installed on the server you can kind of manage them from here see what's going on usually all green means 100 percent healthy you're good to go local server you can see we have three services it's in a red state this doesn't mean the server actually needs immediate assistance or anything like that sometimes it's actual stuff that should not even be running so if we click on local server we can see these three things right here as you can see, it's in a stop state and it's an automatic delayed start. So I mean, if if nobody in the, if nobody in the environment knows that these need to be running or stopped, and yeah, maybe you could look, look into it and see what's going on. But most a lot of servers you go into will have something in red um, because of a service that's not running or something. But, but most of the time, service doesn't even need to be running um, for everything to be working properly. Another thing we can do is we can monitor the server performance, which is crucial. There is ways to basically monitor it remotely and things like that. But for this video, we're gonna go over some things that we can do um, on the server itself. So it's not just, oh, I'm gonna pull up task manager and see what's going on. There's more things you can do with this. Um, but first we can pull up task manager and we do more details, performance, so as you can see right here, we have a little performance area. Uptime is eight minutes. We have our memory here and then our ethernet, which is our internet, ethernet cable. And you can see what processes are running. Um, usually if you click, click on the top of here, um, it will bring the most um, resources being used at the top. So as you can see, server manager is running the most memory. But if we click on CPU, so um, the server host remote, oh, well, it's gone back and forth now, but as you see, server manager is not at the top anymore because we want we want to show the most resources, the most um, resources being used under the CPU. So that's one of the ways. I'm sure you all are probably familiar with task manager very well. Um, 
What else we can do is we can go to, I believe it is performance monitor. This is a little bit different. So this kind of like shows an actual graph and like you can actually, if you click the plus in here and you want to do your local computer, so you see how you have a bunch of different things you can do in here. So there's way more stuff you can add inside of here. It's not just basic CPU, RAM, Ethernet, things like that. So like, I mean, there's just so much more stuff in here. I mean, a lot of the stuff you'll probably never, ever use. So we have, I like, I don't even know what WFPV6 is. Um, but if we hit the drop down, we can see like it has all this stuff in here. So this is kind of what a performance monitor is. And then you can create reports on stuff. You can do like user defined. So this is like a more a more in depth of perform of than task manager. It's like a I guess you could say task manager is a child and then performance monitor would be the uh parents. And then we also have uh, resource monitor. So this is kind of like the task manager too a little bit. We go to overview. So this is the overview of everything. If we go to CPU. It's going to show things specific to the CPU, memory disk, etc. So this kind of gives you like a more visual aspect of the task manager. You can stop monitoring, start monitoring, things like that. And then one of the last things I'm going to cover is the event viewer. So if someone comes to you and says, hey, this something's not working on the server, can you check it out? One of the things you can do is come into event viewer. Event viewer is actually more than what you might think it is. There's a lot of stuff in here. Um, usually when looking at logs and stuff, I mean logs can save you thousands and thousands of hours of trying to troubleshoot what's going on. Usually you can just, if you know what log it would be under, so just say you have unwanted people remoting into your server, you could go to system. I'm sorry, you go to security. And then this will kind of tell you like, hey, what's who's been logging on this and that. So like an account was successfully logged on. So, I mean, and then you also have system, or if like an application is not working correctly on the server. I always like to filter the current log. Then you can, you can change the event level with errors, critical, and warning. And that will most likely, hopefully, bring out something that is useful to you. And then you can also, if you know like the what the event ID might be, you can put it in here. And then also what you probably would want to do is actually filter it down to times. Because um, if you know what time, maybe the application stopped working on the server or just say something went down on the server, something like that, you can usually filter by time and then filter it even more by the event level. And hopefully that brings you to something quicker. And you could also do find. And then if we go to applications and services and then Microsoft and then Windows, as you can see here, we have a whole bunch of more stuff. And this would really come to down just Googling what you might be looking for in here, maybe like group policy is here. We gotta click on this operational. So I mean there's just tons of stuff in here. remote desktop services session there's no events in there so I mean there's a lot of stuff in the event viewer um, definitely not something a, a brand new IT professional would just come in here and, and exactly know what they're doing because but event viewer is very useful and I would definitely recommend looking into it more because logs can save you time and times Okay, guys, um, next we're going to go and jump into the next topic, and I will see you all in a couple seconds.
Now we're going to go over some Windows Server specific tools, such as Windows Server Backup, File Server Resource Manager, and the RDP Services Manager. So right now we're on PLAB SA01. SA stands for standalone. Uh, the Windows Server Backup and File Server Resource Manager is not installed automatically, so we're going to have to install that ourselves. I'm going to show you all how to do that real quick. So if we just go to Manage, Add Roles and Features, Next, Next, Next. And then we want the, go to Next again, and we want the Windows Server Backup, which is right here. And then we also can go Previous, Expand File and Storage Services, File and iSCSI, and we want the File Server Resource Manager. Add Features, Next, Next. And as you can see here, this is just an overview of what we're installing. So we're installing the File and Storage File Server Resource Manager and the Remote Server Administration Tools, which leads down to also the File Server Resource Manager Tools and the Windows Server Backup. We just click Install. That will go through and install. Shouldn't take too long. Okay, so that's done installing now. So now we can go to Tools. And the first one we're going to cover is Windows Server Backup. So we click on Local Backup here. It's reading the data. And this is basically, you can basically back up this whole entire server. Um, so we right click. And you can do Backup Schedule, Backup Once, or Recover. And you can configure the performance settings. So we're going to do Backup Once. We're going to do different options because basically it says choose this option if you want if you have not created a scheduled backup or specify location of items for this backup that you're different from the scheduled backup. So we'll click next. And just say we want to do the full server. Click next. And I would recommend if and a lot of companies they back up to a different source almost. And sometimes if you're in a bigger company you won't even use a local backup or a Windows Server backup. You actually back up through like maybe a different software or something like that. And then maybe you just install the software on the computer and then the software can grab everything from the server. So we'll do a remote shared folder. And we will just do, since this is a standalone server, uh, we'll just do PLAB SA01. I'm just doing C$ dollar sign because that's going to bring us to like the C drive basically. And then we'll just do users. Just for an example, this is definitely not how you would do it in a real company. This is just an example. So I guess you want to do inherit because then whoever has access to this folder will be able to get to the backup. And then this is everything you're backing up right here. And then once you click backup, it will go through. And it will start backing up everything that, you, that, it, that it has. So we're just going to click cancel out of this because we don't want to, this is just an example, so we don't want to actually back it up yet. Right click on here, we can also do a backup schedule. It's not in progress. Let's close out of this. Tools. It's probably because of this failed backup right here. That's what I'm thinking. Because if we schedule the backup, it's just going to fail again. Oh, nope, it went through. Yep, so full server. Um, and then here you can specify when do you want this server to back up. So if you're in a company and you only have one, one to five servers, maybe a local backup using the Windows Server Backup function is maybe the best way to go. So and that, and you also can recover. So we want to recover. Yep, so cannot find any backup sets because we haven't actually backed up anything just yet. And this would be if you want to recover from that shared folder. And that's where you would type in 
shared folder and then go through these. It's This is almost like a wizard almost. And then you also have the configure performance settings. Um, so backups contain full volumes. You can manage the future performance by choosing one of the following settings. So faster backup performance, it's only going to recover the items that were basically last changed from the current backup and the previous backup. And you can do the normal or you can do a custom. So that's kind of the Windows Server backup. Pretty straightforward in my opinion. So now if we head over to the file server resource manager, this is more, this has more stuff um, you can go through. So like you have a quota management. You can sweat, set quotas and things like that. So you can like create a quota. You also have quota templates you can do. So like 200 megabytes report to user. Um, So that's that. And you also have the file screening management. So we just click on file screens. You can create a file screen. There's all that. File screen templates you can do. So we can block executable files, block image files, things like that. That's kind of what the file um, screens is. You can block things and more stuff. You can also do storage reports. So if we generate a report now, it's probably not going to, so like files by owner, maybe. Then you have a classification management. So we just expand this out. Click on folder usage. This folder is used property specifies purpose folder and kind of file stored in it. Um, then you have file management tasks. So if we just create a task. You can do this, uh, we'll just do test, scope, you can set the scope in here. Uh, just do all of these. And we'll go to action, file expiration. I mean, there's just so much stuff in here that you can do. And it's really just getting a lab spin up, spun up and just going through each one of these and just playing around with it, see what happens. The next one we're going to do, go over, is the RDP Services Manager. So right now we are on PLAB DM01. And to get um, remote desktop services up and running, um, we have to do a couple steps with, I don't, I guess, how Practice Labs configures their servers. So the first thing we need to do is we need to right click on the internet icon, open the internet settings, and we need to disable IPv6. We need to disable this. And then we need to open up command prompt. Type net sh win http reset proxy. And then we also need to go to PowerShell and we need to enable PS remoting. And then that will allow us to basically go ahead and get remote desktop services stood up. So we'll go to manage, we'll add a role in feature. And we'll skip this page by default. We're going to do a remote desktop service installation. We're just going to do a quick start because we're not deploying across multiple servers. We'll do a session base because we don't want to um, allow virtual machines, actual virtual machines on this remote desktop services. We're going to deploy to this server. And it'll go through, start checking. It'll give you a restart if need to be. So just go ahead and let this install. And then I will be right back once this installs. Alright, so now we're back on the server manager. Everything has installed. One thing I did have to do is um, to manage the remote desktop services, you have to create a, um, you have to use like a domain AD account. You can't just use a local administrator account. So on PLAB DC01, you just have to create a um, test account and I would just assign it to the domain admins 
security group and the um, administrator, administrator security group, um, just so we can manage everything efficiently. And then on the PLAB DM01, one thing we're going to do is we're just going to open up File Explorer. Or right click this PC and choose Properties. Go to Advanced System Settings, Remote. And then inside of Remote Desktop, we'll just um, have domain users there. So we'll cancel out of this, cancel out of this. So if we go to the Remote Desktop Services, we'll see we have um, this right here. So the main thing you're going to want to worry about is um, this stuff right here. So basically, the RD gateway allows people, allows remote users almost, to connect to it if they're inside a private network or something. Um, that can run the um, remote desktop connection client. The RD licensing is, uh, it manages remote desktop services client access licenses um, that are required for each device or user. So they can use the remote desktop um, session host server. And then the RD um, connection host is basically, a, it's just a, a role service and remote desktop services that enables users to connect to uh, virtual desktops or the quick session, which is basically applications almost. And then what we also have is the um, RD, the remote desktop virtualization host. Um, it's it's basically just a role that enables users to connect to the virtual desktops, as I said earlier. And then you also have the session host um, that allows people to connect remotely again too, to run your programs and things like that. So if we scroll down on here, so that's what I was talking about, these two right here. And then you have your connection broker. So which is your high availability, and then you have you go back up. And you have your gateway and your licensing. So if we do task and we do edit deployment properties, this is where you can configure your gateway, your licensing server, your RD web access. This is the web access URL that you would go to. And also your certificates. Um, so you have to set up certificates and stuff for all this to work properly. So if we just click on this, um, it'll open up Internet Explorer for us. And this is just a broad overview of what Remote Desktop Services is. So I am going to use my, so we're going to click Allow. I am going to use my test account that I made in Active Directory on PLAB BC01. You can see we have our quick session right here. So this would be our, our, our virtual machine um, that we could connect to. So if we go back to our server manager, we'll cancel out of this. We're going to go to, well, actually, if we go down to servers, this is your server that you have for your remote desktop services. This is a collections, and, and then we go to quick session. So this is your connections over here. Um, so you have practice lab slash test that's connected to it right now. Uh, properties, so this is kind of where you can um, you can do the names user groups, okay, so who can see it. Um, sessions, you can edit your session details here. Your security, your load balancing. So this is mainly if you have more than one server. Your client um, settings and your profile disk. So if we cancel out of this, and this is our remote app program. So this is where we can publish a remote app. And it's, this is just some of the common things that it will show you on here. Uh, let's find a regular one that might be, uh, what do you want to do? Let's just say, let's, let's do the server manager, for example. Oh, actually, no, let's do, uh, what do we want to do? Let's do IIS. 
So we'll click Next. IIS installed on here. We will publish. And also, like if you um, want to publish, just say Active Directory users and computers on here. The icon, you can change how the icon looks through PowerShell and stuff, which is pretty cool. IIS installed on here. Uh, no, it is not. Yes, it is right here. So now if we go back to our Internet Explorer and we just refresh. So there you go, you have your IIS now. In which a quick session did go away because we deployed that IIS. And this is technically not a quick session. And this is not a virtual um, desktop deployment. This is just a quick uh, um, an application deployment. So we're only going to be deploying apps. So if we click on this, you can see we have this right here. Just hit connect. Click show details. Oh, we don't allow us. So this might not actually connect because we haven't configured any certificates or anything like that. And it usually works best when you try to connect from just say a different machine. Usually the first connection takes a little bit longer. If it does connect. Come on, computer. One thing I have seen that sometimes does work on the first login, if you have like a user saying, hey, it's configure remote session, but I can't actually get in. Um, if you can actually go into the task manager and users, which is what I was just showing, and sign them out, and then once they reopen it again, it will literally open up right away. We can click cancel out of this. Yeah, see how now it's like frozen up. Yep, so now it just disconnected me out of the whole virtual machine. I'm just going to sign back in real quick. Yep, so we'll just we'll let that hang there. And then you have your host servers right here. So you can add them, remove. So that's really the general overview of remote desktop services. It is it is pretty cool to learn. Um it's very valuable, very very valuable feature to learn. Yeah, so let's just see if it will connect. It probably won't. But... No, we'll, we'll just leave it there. So that is kind of like the basics of what a remote desktop services is. It basically allows a remote person to access applications from the server without actually RDPing into the physical server itself. Okay, everyone, well now we're going to be going over some local features on a Windows server, such as the print and document services, uh, Hyper-V, and file slash storage services, so like your file server and things. First thing we're going to cover is the print and document services. So we are on PLAB SA01 right now. What I had to do was to get the print services to show up. I had to go to Manage, Add Roles and Features, do a role-based installation, Click next again, and then install your print and document services. I did not install the internet printing on the L LPD service um, because for this video, we don't need that. So we'll click cancel out of that. 
And if we go to Tools, and we go to Print Management, so this is kind of like your print management interface. So you have your print servers right here, which is what we're on right now, PLAB SA01. And then your deployed printers are obviously none because we don't have any at the moment. So what you see right here is basically what you have up here too. So you have your drivers, your forms, um, so like your form when you want to print something, your ports, and then your printers. So we have two printers right here which are installed by default. The cool thing about a print server is just say you have 40 printers in the office and you don't want to add 40 printers to every single computer in the office. What you could do is the you could set up a print server, add the 40 printers to this print server, and basically just map the drive that this that this server um, is named. So like one example, and it's not it's not how you would set it up in a real world environment in my opinion, but you could do like PLAB SA01 back, so you do backslash backslash PLAB SA01 backslash, and then once you do that, you'll see all your printers there. But the only thing is if this printer, if this print server goes down and you cannot get it back up, it can be a single point of failure, uh, which is why I, I guess it's still used in environments, but I don't see it as being as as handy anymore. Um, at least in at least in my environment. So if we minimize this, we can go over Hyper V, and you're probably wondering, well, what is Hyper V? So Hyper V is basically it's it's a hypervisor. Um, and it allows operating systems to run on this physical server that we have here, so your PLAB SA01. Um, and it, it, you basically share resources from the host computer, which is PLAB SA01. And you can provide isolation and security between the VMs. Um, and it, it, it's you can mainly use this for testing environments and things like that. Most companies nowadays are probably in ESXi within vSphere. That's just a common one nowadays. Uh, but this is still a pretty handy tool to use. So in my opinion, to really learn Hyper-V, you're going to have to learn about virtualization networking too. So like your virtual switch manager, if you don't know what virtual networking is, how are you going to know what to configure in the virtual switch manager? Uh, so you can import virtual machines from here. You have your Hyper-V settings. So as we went over earlier, your live migrations, you just say you want to do a migration, your NUMA spanning. This is all stuff you can read about. There's a lot of stuff in here. You probably won't learn how to do everything in one day because that's just not realistic anymore. Uh, you have the user based here and then your server here. So like where do you want your default folders to store your virtual machines at? So we click cancel out of here. We can do the virtual SAN manager, which is your storage attached network. So you have your fiber channel SAN right here. And then your global here. And then you also can inspect the disk. Uh, so what virtual hard disk do you want to inspect? And you can also edit the disk. So if you click next, where is our virtual hard disk located? Well, we don't have one right now, so we're not going to be able to um, edit anything. Then over here, if you right click this, you can actually do new virtual machine hard disk or floppy disk. Probably only hard disk and virtual machine is used anymore. This is going back basically spinning up, if you all know what a virtual box is, it's basically spinning up a virtual box and adding like an ISO to it to run a um, OS. So your memory, this is where it's going to be coming from. Your physical server that we're doing this on, so which is PLAB SC01. You can configure your networking. This is your hard disk. And then you also have your operating system. So you have your ISO file, so pretty cool stuff to do with this. But that's kind of like the basics of Hyper-V. It basically allows you to run virtual machines with inside of the physical server. So you don't have to spin up 40 different physical servers to run one operating system. All you have to do is spin up one physical server that's pretty powerful and then install all your sub-servers inside of your Hyper-V manager. So the next thing is your file and storage services, which is right here. 
So you have your servers right here. This is your PLAB SA01. Your volumes, so this is your volumes right here. Let's expand this. And if you go to task up here, you can do new volume. And then your disk down here, do a new volume again down here. So there's multiple ways to do one thing. And then your shares. So if you wanted to do a share, you would have to do next. Come on. Click out of this, we'll go to manage. Add roles and features, next, next. Basically we have to install a file server role um, for you to be able to basically create a share on this server. Is it going to do anything? Let's refresh. Manage, add roles, next, next. Usually this goes through very quickly. All right, so I'm probably just going to have to reset this box real quick, and then I'll be right back to show you the file server row itself. Okay, guys, so I had to reset the VM. Uh, so we're going to install the file server row. Uh, we can install all of these, but these are more in-depth topics that we can go over later, um, like your distributed file system, replication namespaces, data duplication, branch cache, or network files, things like that. So the main one we're going to focus on in this um, little broad overview is file server. So we'll click next. There's nothing need to be done here. And we'll click install. And this will allow us to make a share on this server. So I can show you like a very basic um, tutorial on how to do it. And this shouldn't take too long. And remember, this series is just a broad overview of some things on a Windows server. So once you get comfortable with a Windows server, then you can start diving into certain topics that you can install on a Windows server. So that's done. Now we're going to file and storage services. So now we have shares, iSCSI, and work folders. So if we click on shares, to create a file share, start the new new share wizard. Well, we, don't, we can't click here too, but... We'll just do task, and then we'll do new share. And then we're just going to do an SMB share quick, because you can do like an, NF, an NFS share, um, which is usually used for sometimes Linux systems, and also Windows too. So we're just going to do a quick one. And this is our, we're going to be using the C drive for this, because we haven't added any other volumes or anything, or any partition, any disk yet. The share name is going to be called server. And this is the remote path right here. And this is just going off the host name of the system. And then these are different options you can check off. We're just going to allow the caching of the share, keep everything simple for this. And then we're going to customize these permissions. And then inherit it from all that it's doing, it's basically just grabbing the permissions from the C drive, basically. So we're going to disa disable inheritance. We're going to move off. And just for this video, we're just going to add domain users. Check names. Oh, wait, you know why? Because this is a standalone. This does not have Active Directory on it yet. So domain users is not going to work. Is administrator even going to work? P 
PLAB SA01 backslash admin. Let's see if that does anything. No, it does not. This does not even have local users or anything on it. Okay. Let's see something here, guys. Administrator. There we go. So I just had to type out the full name. Sometimes if you're in a domain environment um, that has Active Directory built, you won't have to type out the full name. Uh, but I guess since it's a standalone server with no Active Directory, you have to. And we'll just give the administrator of the server full access, full control. We'll click Apply. We'll click OK. Click Next. And this is just your overview of what you're doing. And we'll click Create. And we'll close it. So now, if we go to PLAB SA01 backslash server, you'll have your server. But now if you just do PLAB SA01, I have your server right here too. And what we might be able to do is go to the C drive. And we'll go to shares. If it will click into it, and we'll right click properties. We might be able to change the name of. Yeah, so you can change the name of it. We click add. Um, and we just want to do server one, two, three. Click OK. Click apply. Click OK. Click close. And now when we go to PLAB, now you also have server one, two, three, but that's being managed by the, um, the file explorer. So what I just showed you there, that was another way you can share folders and things. It doesn't have to be done through the file and storage services. This might take a few minutes. And then you also have work folders too. I mean, that just allows you to access files on different devices, such as your laptops, desktops, even maybe even mobile devices. Um, but then that just goes back to setting up like a personal drive for users. So you can do that through Active Directory too. And this is still loading. So yeah, that is a basics overview of what the file and storage services are. We also went over the Hyper-V Manager. And we also went over the, um, what else did we cover? File and Storage Manager. And we also went over the Print and Document Services. So this is the Work Folders part. We can click Add, New Sync Share, New Quota Template. And you also see what we did here. We also have the server one, two, three here also under the same C drive. And to end this whole entire series of the server of the Windows Server overview, we're going to go over some common things that companies would use a Windows Server for, such as DHCP. Uh, web servers such as also known as IIS, 
um, Active Directory domains and trust, and also Active Directory users and computers. We're not going to go over every single thing um, inside of these or show you any like kind of configurations, just going to show you what they are and kind of what they do. So the first one we're going to go over is DHCP. And that is basically you're, assign, you're giving IP addresses to computers, um, anything among those lines that might be getting a um, dynamic IP address. So just say you have in one region of the company, you only want to assign just say certain IPs to those computers through the server. And this also goes back to the switches, the routers, everything among those lines. Uh, so this, you would right click IPv4 and you would just do like a new scope. That would be the IP address scope that you want to assign. Uh, fail over, so in case this DHCP server goes down, you want to fail it over to another server so their IP addresses keep getting leased out and stuff. Multicast scope, you can replicate the failover scopes. So that's kind of what DHCP is. There's definitely more things you can do with it. Um, you can set policies. So if we do like new policy, uh, this feature allows you to show configurable settings, DHCP options to clients based on certain conditions, such as vendor class, things like that. There's a lot of cool stuff in DHCP that you can do. Uh, next one is going to be the IIS. And this is where you would, most companies would like put a website. So you, if you have an internal website or even external, um, that is available to everyone. Uh, no matter where you are and what network, it's available. So this would be the where they would possibly store it at. So IIS, a lot of stuff in IIS. It takes quite a long time to really know what you're doing inside of IIS. Common things that I see in IIS that uh, you should know going in as like a system admin or something would be like server certificates for the website, uh, authentication, uh, application pools is another one that you should know about. Uh, if we go to default website, uh, this bindings is a common one. So if you go to bindings, this is where you would put like your port 443 and assign your um, SSL certificate or something. Among those lines, you can restart the website from here. Your SSL settings. Uh, so if we just go to browse, it's just going to pull us to the default website which is this uh, most websites are most of the time if you go to your file explorer go to this PC go to the C drive and you go to in that pub and then you go to dub 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 root this is where most of your um, websites configurations might lie inside of a company uh, Active Directory Domains and Trust. So if you have multiple domain names and you want to just say trust another domain so they can use your resources and stuff, that's where you would do your Active Directory Domain and Trust. Uh, you can delete them from here, add them, configure them, things among those lines. Uh, so if you have a very big company, multiple domains, you would send out those trusts so you can get to those resources between domains. Another one is Active Directory Users and Computers, which a lot of y'all, if you're working in Help Desk already, you might already know about this. So this is where all the users, um, the computers, domain controllers, this is where all your server names and things, this is where all it would live at. So if you go to Users, you can see if you your users here, you can create a user right here. Uh, so this is where everything in the, among those ones would live at. Uh, computers. This is where you're, this, like, if you don't put the computer name inside of AD first, um, and you just join it to the domain on the physical machine, this is where the computer would drop at, in this computer's container right here. Uh, if you right-click practicelabs.com, you can change the domain, change your domain controller. Uh, you can raise it. Uh, definitely don't try to raise or operations masters, anything like that, without getting proper approval. Or if you 100% know what you're doing and you need to do something among those lines. Uh, and you're, and also another thing um, called group policy where you assign policies to particular OUs. The OUs, organizational units, that's where they're coming out of here, the active directory domain users. And then that's when you can open up group policy 
and assign certain policies to certain OUs based on what the users or computers need to do or need to have. Uh, this little icon right here with the two little users, this is where you would create a group name. So security would be you want to assign permissions to something such as a, a, a file, a folder. Um, just say you want to assign permissions to security group to have admin privileges on a computer. This is where you would do it at, create the group at. And then your distribution group would be, you want to you want to add 40 people to this distribution group. So when you open up Outlook, all you got to do is type in the dis distribution group name, and then you can send the email out. to so those 40 people inside the distribution group, instead of typing in 40 different names. So these are just some common things that we that we use a Windows Server for in a real world environment. Uh, but in the next video, we're, what we're going to go over is the Active Directory domain services, because I think that one of the most important things you need to know about a Windows Server is the Active Directory domain services.